Allah has done gifts to you, given gifts to you, if you have even, even an ounce of decency, you would worship Allah and become more of His slave. Because naturally, after you mention Allah's favor, then the natural consequence of that is that you want to be His slave. By the way, this happens all over Qur'an. The most easiest example to remember is Surah Al-Fatiha. First Allah mentions Alhamdulillah. Right? The first thing He mentions. He didn't mention Maliki Yawmiddin first, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim first. None of the Rabbil Alameen, none of that is mentioned first. What is mentioned first is Alhamdulillah. What should, be, what should He be praised for? And what should He be thanked for? Is mentioned first. That, ad, that attitude of ours. Once you have that attitude, it's easy for you to establish that He is your Rabb. So Alhamdulillah, He Rabb. And then later on, Iyaka Na'budu. So here Allah mentions His favors. So what's the conclusion? Fal-Ya'budu then they should be slaved, enslaved themselves willingly, and they should worship only the Lord, the master of this house. So it's a conclusion. Then al farra and this is interesting because you know, I think we had this discussion before in this series, but just to remind you, there are two schools of thought within Ahl sunnah about the, the, the sequencing of the surahs in the Qur'an. Essentially one argument is that this, this sequencing of the surahs is only because of the ijma' of the sahaba that this has nothing to do with revelation, it's just the consensus of the Sahaba. Other scholars say, no, it is the ijma of the Sahaba, but it is also tawqifi, it's part of revelation. And we've had a detailed discussion about that before. But one of the scholars that was staunchly on the side that says, no, it has nothing to do with revelation. That there's no benefit in knowing this, the sequence of the surahs, because that is just an ijma issue, it is not a, an issue of revelation. One such scholar is Ash-Shawkani rahimahullah who is an ad, he's adamant opponent of the idea of divine sequence. But even in his tafsir, when it comes to this surah, he caves in and he says, Rahimahullah, هذه السورة متصلة بالسورة الأولى. This surah is connected to the previous one. Qu- quoting from Al-Farra. لأنه ذكر سبحانه أهل مكة بعظيم نعمته عليهم فيما فعل بالحبشة. Because Allah mentions the amazing favor He did for them in how He dealt with the people of Habasha. قَالَ لِإِلَى فِي قُرَيْشِ أَيْ فَعَلْنَا ذَلِكَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ نِعْمَةً مِنَّا عَلَى قُرَيْشِ We will have a detailed discussion about what He just said, but I'll roughly translate for you. He is saying the next surah begins, لِإِلَى فِي قُرَيْشِ Which is easily translated or commonly translated for for the convenience of Quraysh, or for the covenants of Quraysh. We'll discuss the word ilaf in a little bit. But the word for implies what for? And he says it's connected to the previous surah. We destroyed the people of Habasha for the convenience of Quraysh. So he's looking at the conclusion of the previous surah, he turned them into chewed up straw, so that you could have convenience. So he's saying that the ending of that surah is tied to the beginning of the next surah, and this is reported by many a narration in tafsir history. وَذَلِكَ أَنَّ قُرَيْشٍ كَانَتْ تَخْرُجُ فِي تِجَارَتِهِمْ That is important because the Quraysh used to go out for their uh, journeys, and, and they used to head in Yemen's direction all the time. And if this army was to survive, they wouldn't be able to go. Again, so it was important, not only did Allah protect Mecca, but He also destroyed their army, so that their caravans would be able to continue. فَلَا يُغَارُ عَلَيْهَا فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ And they would never be attacked and never be, there would never be an ambush against them in the days of Jahiliyyah. So now we turn to the beginning of Surah Quraysh. This was just a little bit about what connects the two. Of course you remember the other thing that connects these two is the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. We already talked about that, right? So Allah, Ibrahim alayhi salam asked Allah, رَبِّ جَعَلْ هَذَا بَلَدًا آمِنًا وَارْزُقْ أَهْلَهُ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ He asked and make this a peaceful city, that's Surah Al-Fil. And provide them from all kinds of fruit, take care of their provision, that's this surah. So because of the prayer of Ibrahim alayhi salam, these two are also connected. But now let's begin with the word ilaf. The word ilaf. It comes from ulfa in Arabic, which means to have affection towards someone, to have a soft heart towards someone, to be easy with someone, or to, to have your feelings change towards someone for the better. In other words, something that something happens and your feelings towards someone change and you develop an affection, a love, a devotion, or a dedication towards them. Right? That is ulfa. That's from which this word comes. That's the origin of the word. But that's the trilateral form, the mujarrad form. Thulathi mujarrad, alafa. But then the, the mazid fi form, there are two. Alafa from if'al and alafa. There are two different words. Alafa is used in Surah Ali Imran, for example. It says, فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَا قُلُوبِكُمْ تَأْلِيف This word means to make, to cause love to happen between you, two people. So Allah says, Allah is the one who caused love to occur between the believers. 
You know, so they used to be enemies. وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَى you know عَلَى شَفَا حُفْرَةٍ مِنَ النَّارِ In that famous ayah of Surah Ali Imran, Allah Azza wa Jalla says He caused love between your hearts. He uses the word alafa, but here alafa is not used. If alafa was used instead of finding the ilafi Quraysh, we would have found lita ilafi Quraysh. The word would have been different. But the the infinitive form here is ilaf. Ilaf means to cause love also. But the, the, the reason I highlighted the ayah from Ali Imran is you need to know the difference between ilaf and ta'lif. Ta'lif is to make love happen over time. Ilaf is to have make love happen between two immediately. Something happens that's so powerful that softens your heart immediately. You know you have a rough relationship between two parties and something good happens and you get a little nicer then something happens and you get a little nicer and over time you become nice to them. It doesn't happen overnight. Or another scenario where something so powerful happens that you're completely soft immediately. When it happens immediately, it takes no time, the if'al form, ilaf, that's used. When it takes time, then it's ta'lif. And Allah describes that between believers. Meaning believers didn't become brothers overnight, it took, it took some work. They are muhajirun, they are ansar, they were enemies tribally from before. So just because you said, ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu, it didn't take all of your previous baggage away overnight, it takes time. You're human beings, right? It takes time. So that their alafa was used. But here ilaf, suggesting that the Quraysh have had so many, many things that Allah has gifted to them, that their hearts should become soft easily. There sh- it shouldn't be, it shouldn't take them any time for their hearts to become soft. Allah miraculously protected them from an enormous army. That enough should make their hearts soft that they should want to pray to Allah. You know when something really, really overwhelmingly good happens to you, to someone who even have, has an ounce of faith, even if they're not Muslim, when something amazingly good happens to them, they feel the urge to want to thank Allah. And actually even if they, if they don't go to a church or a synagogue or a temple or even a masjid to pray, at the very least the words come out of their mouth, they can't even help it. Thank God. Thank you Lord. Thank you God. These words just come out of your mouth when something amazingly good happens. Well these people enjoyed some remarkable favor from Allah. That's why the word ilaf is used. Meaning, I did all of this so your hearts could become soft. So you could soften up. But when, because when the heart softens up towards who? Towards Allah. When your heart becomes soft towards Allah, then it will be easy for you to be Allah's slave. If your heart hasn't become soft, you can't be Allah's slave. So Allah mentioned the softening of the hearts in ilaf first, and then later on, فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ then they should become slaves of, to, to the master of the Lord, the Lord of this house, the master of this house. So the slavery, the worship is mentioned later, the softening of the hearts is mentioned first. And here we're learning something remarkable about human psychology. We will turn to Allah when our hearts have become soft. And if you find it's hard for you to turn towards Allah, probably the reason is, your hearts haven't become soft yet. Or you haven't really acknowledged the favors Allah has done to you that should cause your hearts to become soft. The other meaning of ilaf, as I mentioned in the first lesson on Surah Al-Fil, you know when we talked about Ashabul ilaf the four brothers in the ancestry of Quraysh who made all those agreements, and they were called the people of ilaf because they softened up the hearts of these other nations to do business with them. To not look at them as enemies, to look at them as business partners, they have to soften them up. By the way, this even happens in the business world today. You don't just go and sign a treaty, you go out to lunch. Right? You go and the executives have lunch and they shake hands and they, you know, they'll go, they'll have a budget for entertaining the executive. Or to put them in the executives. All of that for what? To soften them up a little bit. That's why that, that word ilaf is used there too. So Allah is saying, Azza wa Jal, I did, I destroyed your enemy for you. I destroyed him for you, so your, your trade agreements from the past could be retained. That all of those trade agreements would not fall into ruin. Because if Abraha's plan succeeds, then all of those agreements are gone, they're finished. So that's the secondary meaning of the, the word ilaf here. Then just about the word, the letter lam in li ilaf, that first letter li, four, that there's a lot of commentary on this. And yakuna ma'na al-kalam. We're gonna go to the Basri grammarians. The, there are two schools of grammar. There's the Basri school, there's the Kufan school. And they both had different conclusions about this lam. So we'll look at both of their conclusions. The Basri's first. And yakuna ma'na al-kalam, that the meaning of the speech would be, 
ففعلنا بأصحاب الفيل هذا الفعل نعمة منا على أهل هذا البيت that we did this to the people of the elephant what we did with them in the previous surah in other words as a favor to the people who live in the surroundings of this house وإحسانا منا إليهم and as a favor from us towards them إلى نعمتنا عليهم في رحلة الشتاء والصيف uh, in addition to the other favor that they can go in caravans in the summer and the winter. In other words, their understanding is that this lamb is connected to the previous surah. As opposed to this, by the way, when we look at the, the, the Kufan school, they say, إِنَّهُ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَلَىٰ عَجَّبَ نَبِيَّهُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ That Allah Azza wa Jal is making His Messenger, be, um, he's, he's amazing His Messenger. The word li in Arabic can be used to express amazement. So the Kufans are saying, you don't have to look at this lamb connected to the previous surah. You can look at this lamb as by itself. And then the meaning would be how amazing that Allah softened the hearts of Quraysh. How amazing it is that these people, you know, they, they do all kind, all manner of crime against Allah. Against the people, they bury the baby girl, they cheat in business. And against Allah, they do all forms of shirk. Especially at the house Allah built for tawheed, they do shirk, which is the worst kind of crime. And even then Allah wants to soften their hearts. How amazing is that? How amazing is Allah's mercy? So the lamb they look at is, uh, look at it in the form of lamb at ta'ajjub. That's how they look at it. Lamb to amaze. This is an amazing thing that Allah does. What an amazing extension of mercy Allah is giving these people. That's how they look at it. اعجب يا محمد لنعم الله على قريش في إلافهم رحلة الشتاء والصيف. Be shocked, O Muhammad, at the favors of Allah upon Quraysh in, in giving them the convenience of traveling in the summer and the winter. Ibn Zayd explaining this relationship says, again he connects it to the previous surah, so we'll skip his commentary. But he says specifically towards the end that Allah thoroughly, he says actually the entire surah, أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِأَصْحَابِ الْفِيلِ That first ayah, أَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ كَيْدَهُمْ فِي تَضْلِيلِ وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلِ Every one of these ayat are connected to لِإِلَى فِي قُرَيْشِ What that means is, he, they, they themselves, their hearts became soft because how Allah destroyed them. Then the plans of the other failed, so their covenants, their, their treaties should, be, should remain intact. Every part of the ayah has a benefit to soften the hearts of the Quraysh. That's what he's man, uh, uh, referring to. So this ta'ad, lam of ta'ajub, let's look at some more commentary about it. اِعْجَبُوا لِإِلَافِ قُرَيْشِ إِحْلَةَ الشِّتَعِ وَالصَّيْفِ وَتَرْكِهِمْ عِبَادَةَ رَبِّهِ عِبَادَةِ رَبِّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ This is amazing commentary. How shocking is it that Allah wants to soften their hearts and does them so many favors, and yet they abandon the worship of the Lord of this house, this house that their ancestor built so they could worship the right Lord. How shocking is that? So they use that lamb of ta'ajjub to express Allah's amazement with these people. How can they do such a thing? الَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفٍ Despite the fact that He provides them in their time, in, in, against hunger and gives them safety against fear. Then the third implication. أَن تَكُونَ هَذِهِ اللَّامِ غَيْرُ مُتَعَلِّقَ لَا بِمَا قَبْلِهَا, لا بما قبلها ولا بما بعدها. That this lamb could be disconnected with what is before it and what is, what is, what is after it. In other words, it's just saying the only purpose we gave the, the Quraysh, the convenience of traveling, is that they should become more grateful and their hearts should become soft. This is a very important lesson. Without getting into the Arabic, I'll just share this with you. What, what this, the, the essence of the argument is. You see, the Quraysh are the custodians of Allah's house. So they're supposed to, and, and Ibrahim made dua to Allah that the people all over the world, their hearts should be softened towards this house. Okay? That the people, people's hearts should have this affinity towards Allah's house. And all believers know that they have that softness towards Allah's house. And if you've never been there, your heart desires to go there. You wanna go to Had, you wanna see Allah's house. But the people who are custodians of it should have the softest hearts. They should have the softest hearts. But the thing that makes your heart hard, is worldly occupation. You're busy making a buck. You're busy trying to provide for your family, things like that. So you're pre so busy in dunya, you don't have time for worshipping Allah and your hearts become hard. So Allah makes their life so easy, they don't have to do anything that the other tribes have to do. The other tribes barely survive. So if these people were a starving nation, then they would only be worried about food and protecting themselves and they wouldn't have, have any time to worship Allah properly. So Allah got rid of their other concerns and gave them economic prosperity. So their minds would not be occupied with that stuff. Now they can concentrate on worshiping Allah. 
You know, there are two kinds of people that have um, uh, that amass good wealth, people that have make good money and have good salary. You can do two things. Either if you have good salary, you can become even more engrossed in dunya. You have good money and you say, might as well go all out. Party, make, the, make my entire life a big party. Right? And you're constantly looking to add more luxuries in your life. And make more money out of the money you already have. Or you could say, man, I'm doing well. There's food on the, on the table, there's a roof over my head, I'm doing well enough. So you know what I need to do? Now that my time is freed up from having to seek dunya, and Allah has provided me enough, I can take breaks and study Allah's deen, and worship Him, and maybe take 10 days off and make i'tikaf in Ramadan. Because if, even if I don't make that extra bonus money, there's still enough in the house. We're doing okay. So I can take some extra time out. I can do some extra worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no one should do that more than the custodians of Allah's house, is the essential argument. You know, this, this came to mind, I don't mean to knock on physicians or anything. So don't take this personally if you're a physician. But I have a physician who's a friend who works part-time. You know, he's got a couple of kids, he works part and he makes good money. He makes like a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year, decent salary for a part-time physician, right? And so somebody asked him, why don't you work full-time, man? He goes, yeah, I could work full-time and make 600,000, 500,000, but I'm doing okay with 200,000. And I, I need the rest of the time to memorize Qur'an and to teach my kids and to spend time with them and to do things with them. So why should I, you know, what am I going to make this money for? If I, well, Allah has given me enough and I can do other better things with my time and spend my life in a more meaningful way, then why not? Allah didn't create me to make more money. You know, He created me for another purpose. So if I can survive doing less and do more meaningful things, why not? You know, what a beautiful answer. Because you know what I find? People who do make a lot of money, you know what ends up being sacrificed? The family. They don't get any time. You're too busy making the money. You're too busy going out and, you know, get, doing the overtime and then sacrificing the vacation, and you're never, and you, by the time you come home, the kids are already asleep. But by, before you leave for work, they are, you know, they, they're not even, they, they haven't even woken up and you're gone, so you don't see them. And you see them on weekends, but you're too tired, because you've been working all week, so you don't get to play anything with them. Whenever they come to spend time with you, you say, go to your room, didn't I buy you enough toys already with all that money I made? So go, you spend time with those toys, right? And these kids are completely distanced from you. They don't have anything to do with you except your money. And by the time they get older, and they're independent, and then you have a little bit of time, you've retired, or you want to spend some time with them, and you say, talk to me son for a little bit. They say, I, I gotta go dad, I don't have time. You know what you did to them when they were little, they're doing to you when they get older, and you're shocked. And then you come to the imam of the masjid, brother, my son doesn't talk to me. I don't know what to do. My daughter doesn't, sp- doesn't even look at me. Every time I try to talk to them, say, I'm on the phone, I'm busy, I can't talk right now. Well, you bought him the phone. <laughs> and you bought him the unlimited plan too, right? So... <laughs> So who, who are you blaming, right? But the idea that, that, that I'm trying to present, that, that third concept, is that Allah softened their hearts because they more than anyone else need to be economically concern-free so they can devote themselves to the worship of Allah's house and taking care of that house. That is why Allah gave them all of these luxuries. SubhanAllah. What an amazing concept. Now next time somebody enjoys good wealth, they should think about why is Allah giving me this wealth? And what am I, how am I using it? What am I doing with it? Subhanallah. Now the, the three possibilities of lam as, as far, actually there are two possibilities, we'll just go over them briefly, because I don't think there's too much benefit in the, the technicalities of the surah, uh, even though there, there are a lot of subtleties, but we'll, we'll gloss over them inshallah ta'ala, and get to the juicy part inshallah. So the, the first thing I want to highlight here is lam al-uquba, lam al-uquba, that this lam has been understood as a lam of consequence. In other words, because Allah softened their hearts, فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ Because of that, they should enslave themselves. Allah gave them all of these things and softened their hearts and made it easy for their hearts to be softened. And because of that, as a consequence, if, not gonna, if you're not gonna thank Allah for any other of His favors, at least thank Him for this one. At least this one. And then this, enough should be, uh, this should be enough for your hearts to be softened towards His worship. Then, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, you know, actually we'll go further than ilaf, we'll go to the word Quraysh now. We did enough on the lam, lam al-uquba, lam al-ta'ajjub, we did with lam al-ta'ajjub, that it's shocking that they did this. Lam al-uquba, that because Allah did this, they should worship Allah. So the falya'budu becomes jawab al shart It connects to that. Or this lam is connected with the previous surah. That Allah gave them these things because of, and, and Allah destroyed Quraysh so that they could have convenience and ease. So there are three implications of that lam. But now we're coming to the word Quraysh itself. Why are they called Quraysh even? You know, the word Quraysh comes from taqarrush. 
Taqarrush in Arabic means to gather people from very different distances. This is important because the tribe came together how? You remember the history? They came from all over and they had settled all over Arabia. They had come and then they settled, they were brought together, unified together. So one of the reasons they're called Quraysh is because they were a gathering of very dispersed peoples. That's one implication. The second is that the word Quraysh comes from Qarsh. Qarsh, I'll, I'll read the Arabic definition, هُوَ دَابَّةٌ عَظِيمَةٌ فِي الْبَحْرِ تَعْبِثُ بِالسُّفُنِ 